But before we get into our study, we want to ask for the Lord's presence. So please bow your heads with me wherever you are. Father in heaven, we come before your awesome throne in the powerful name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. We know that when Jesus represents us, you hear and you answer. So we plead for your presence, open our minds and hearts to receive the message that you have for us and to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible tells us that God chose the nation of Israel by His grace. He delivered them from bondage because He had a very special purpose for them. Let's read about this in Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verses 6 through 8. Deuteronomy 7, 6 through 8. There we are told, God is speaking, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for Himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set His love on you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all peoples. But, now he's going to give two reasons why he chose him. But, because the Lord loves you, and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So God is saying, I chose you because of the promise to the fathers and because I love you. Not because you're more in number, not because you're the most important, but because in my grace, I chose you. So God chose Israel and made a covenant with them. It was actually a marriage covenant. Notice Jeremiah chapter 31 and verses 31 and 32. Jeremiah 31, 31 and 32. Here Jeremiah is reminiscing about what occurred at Mount Sinai. This is how it reads. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, now notice this, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. So at Mount Sinai, the covenant was a marriage covenant between God and Israel. Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse 8 expresses it in different words, but the same concept. We're told there in Ezekiel 16 verse 8, God is speaking once again, When I passed by you again and looked upon you, indeed your time was the time of love. So I spread my wing over you and covered your nakedness. Yes, I swore an oath to you and entered into a covenant with you, and you became mine, says the Lord, the Lord God. And so you'll notice here that God chose Israel as his bride and made a covenant with them. But God made a covenant with them for a special purpose. They had to fulfill their part of the bargain, so to speak, they had to fulfill a mission for which God chose them. And what was that mission? Let's go to Exodus chapter 19 and verses 4 through 6. Exodus 19, 4 through 6. Here we have the reason for the election of Israel as God's bride. It says there, God is speaking, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Notice once again the idea of intimacy. Verse 5, Now therefore, if, notice a very important little word, two letters, if you will indeed obey my voice, and keep my covenant, then, 
if they fulfill the end of the bargain, then you will be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And then God says to them, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. The meaning of this is that God wanted them to be a witness to the entire world. In other words, they would be intercessors for the world. They would share the gospel far and wide until the whole world was evangelized. Isaiah 49 and verse 6 explains their mission and the reason for the election in a very, very clear manner. Notice Isaiah 49 and verse 6. Here once again, God speaks to His people. Indeed, He says, It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the pre preserved ones of Israel. Notice, I didn't only choose you to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. God chose them for a broader purpose. Notice the last part of the verse. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles. It could be translated to the nations that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. So God formed this marriage covenant with Israel. He chose them by His grace. He delivered them from bondage. He married them at Mount Sinai and He called them to share the salvation message to the world. However, in order to fulfill their mission, they had to receive from God the necessary resources. Did God merely ask them to witness to the world or did God provide the resources for them to be successful in that endeavor? The fact is that God gave them all of the resources to be the most prosperous and godly nation on the planet in order to be able to fulfill their mission of proclaiming the Messiah, the coming Messiah to the entire world. What blessings did God impart to Israel so that they could bless the entire world? Well, first of all, God gave them a patient and godly leader who was constantly being criticized by the congregation. He also gave them a, an enviable system of organization. Even though Israel was a theocracy, we think that God called all the shots. It wasn't that way. They had a representative style of governance under the absolute leadership of God through His servant Moses. You know, we could make an equivalency between their organization and the organization of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. In this case, Moses would be equivalent to the president of the General Conference. The priests would be the elders or the pastors. The Levites would be the deacons. They cared for the tabernacle, for the poor, for the offerings, just like the deacons do today. The Council of the Seventy, representatives from all of the tribes, would be the General Conference Executive Committee. The tribes would be the divisions. The thousands would be the unions. The hundreds would be the conferences. The fifties would be the church district. And the tens would be the local church. God established a representative style of governance an enviable style of organization. God gave them the Ten Commandments, His law. He gave them the Sabbath. He gave them principles of health and hygiene. He gave them educational principles about how to bring up the next generation. He gave them a, a, a system of financing their outreach through tithes and offerings. He gave them the sanctuary service. He gave them rules for worship and uh, worship music. He gave them the festivals to point to events relating to the first coming and events relating to the second coming. God gave them all of the resources necessary to fulfill their mission. However, they needed a land, a center from which to disperse all across the world. 
And so God promised to give them a land flowing with milk and honey to carry forward from that center the work of outreach to the world. In Genesis 35 and verse 12, we find the promise that God made to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and to Israel. It says there, The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, I give to you, here he's speaking to Jacob, and to your descendants after you, I give this land. God gave the promise of giving this land to uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the descendants of Jacob. Now there's one little detail which it would be good to touch upon. You remember that God called Abraham when he was in Ur of the Chaldees. Then he moved him to Haran and eventually to the land of Canaan. And yet Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob for a period did not remain in the promised land. They took a detour down to Egypt for about 215 years. And then they returned to the promised land. Why? Ellen White wrote this very interesting paragraph about the reason why God took Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and his sons down to Egypt for 215 years before returning them to the land from which they were to witness to the world. I read from Patriarchs and Prophets 232. The assurance, and now Ellen White quotes, Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will there make of thee a great nation, was significant. The promise had been given to Abraham of a posterity, numberless as the stars, but as yet the chosen people had increased but slowly, and the land of Canaan now offered no field for the development of such a nation as had been foretold. It was in the possession of powerful heathen tribes that were not to be dispossessed by what God had said until the fourth generation. If the descendants of Israel were here to become a numerous people, in other words, if they became a numerous people in Canaan, they must either drive out the inhabitants of the land or disperse themselves among them. The former, according to the divine arrangement, they could not do. And should they mingle with the Canaanites, they would be in danger of being seduced into idolatry. Egypt, however, offered the conditions necessary to the fulfillment of the divine purpose. A section of country, well watered and fertile, was open to them there, it's known as Goshen, affording every advantage for their speedy increase. And the antipathy they must encounter in Egypt on account of their occupation, for every shepherd was an abomination unto the Egyptians, would enable them to remain a distinct and separate people and would thus serve to shut them out from participation in the idolatry of Egypt. How interesting how divine providence works. They could not stay in the promised land. They were not sufficient enough to conquer the pagan tribes that were there. And if they dispersed among the Canaanites, they would adopt the idolatry of the Canaanites. And so God says, I'm going to take them down to Egypt, to a land that they will have all to themselves, to Goshen. There they can become a great nation without being defiled with all of the idolatrous practices of the Egyptians. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 8, when the people arrived at the promised land, God says to them, See, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give to them and their descendants after them. So after the 215 years, now they come to the borders of Canaan and they are to conquer the land from which they will evangelize the world according to God's plan. So God placed them in a location where they could become prosperous, a strategic land in the ancient world. 
right in the midst of the Fertile Crescent, where agricultural cycles were regular, and the festivals that were dependent upon the cycles of agriculture the, the, where the events of the first and second coming of the Messiah would be announced by the celebration of their spring and fall feasts. They were placed at the very center of three continents where people would come through as they moved from one continent to another. Let's read Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verses 5 through 9 about the plan that God had for them in the land. It says there in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 5, God is speaking, Surely I have taught you statutes and judgments, just as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should act according to them in the land which you go to possess. Therefore, listen carefully, therefore be careful to observe them. See, God not only gave them the physical blessings of the land, God gave them statutes and judgments. And so God says, therefore be careful to observe them. For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us for whatever reason we may call upon Him? And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all this law which I set before you this day? Only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. You see, there was a danger that Israel would focus on its prosperity and come to the conclusion that their greatness was due to their wisdom, their capacities, and their abilities. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 18 through 20, God again warned them, be faithful to your marriage vows, so to speak. Be faithful to your end of the covenant. Listen to my statutes and judgments and laws. Obey them so that you can be a healthy, happy, and holy people. In Deuteronomy 8, verses 18 to 20, we find these words. And you shall remember. That's the antonym of forget. And you shall remember the Lord your God. For it is He who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers, as it is this day. Then it shall be, notice the little key word, if you by any means forget the Lord your God, notice he started by saying you shall remember the Lord your God, now he says, then it shall be if you by any means forget the Lord your God, and follow other gods, and serve them and worship them, I testify against you this day that you shall surely perish. As the nations which the Lord destroys before you, so you shall perish because you would not be obedient to the voice of the Lord your God. They were chosen by grace without merit, but their end of the covenant was to love God back by obeying Him, by listening to His voice and following God's will. In Deuteronomy chapter 13 and verse 4, we find God using several synonymous words to describe what He expected as a response from Israel. It says there in Deuteronomy 13 verse 4, notice, you shall walk after the Lord your God, and second, fear Him. Three, and keep His commandments. Four, and obey His voice. Five, you shall serve Him. Six, hold fast to Him. And if you look at the previous verse, verse 3, it says you shall love the Lord your God. So God says, love me, walk after me, fear me, keep my commandments, obey my voice, serve me, hold fast to me. That was Israel's response to her husband, what it should have been her response. But God gave the blessings and the curses of the covenant. Blessings if they kept their end of the bargain, curses 
if they didn't. Let's read about the blessings or some of the blessings that God described in Deuteronomy 28 and verses 8 to 13. Deuteronomy 28, 8 to 13. The Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in thy storehouses, and in all that thou settest thine hand unto, and he shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. The Lord shall establish thee as a holy people unto himself. Now notice the three uh, synonymous expressions. Uh, the Lord shall command the blessing, he shall bless thee, he shall establish thee as he swore. But now notice it continues speaking about the condition. Let's go back a little ways. The Lord God shall establish thee as a holy people unto himself as he hath sworn unto thee. Now comes the little word again. If thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways, all, and all the people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of thee, and the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods, in the fruit of thy body, and in the fruit of thy cattle, and in the fruit of thy ground. In the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers to give thee, the Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure, the heaven to give you the rain unto thy land in his season, and to bless all the work of thine hand. And the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail. Notice, the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail. And thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath. Now comes the little word again. If that thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and to do them. What a magnificent plan. God marries Israel at Mount Sinai. And then God says to them, this is a covenant. I will keep my end of the bargain. I will provide you a land. I will provide you all of the blessings and all of the resources to, for you to fulfill my mission. But if you don't, there are the curses of the covenant that will befall you. Now, I'm not going to read the curses of the covenant. They are actually uh, terrible uh, in their description there in the second half of Deuteronomy chapter 28. Terrible things would happen to them, and actually many of these things actually did happen to them. Sadly, Israel lost its way. They did not keep their end of the covenant. They broke their marriage vows, if you please. Let's notice Jeremiah chapter 11 and verse 8. Jeremiah 11 and verse 8. Here it says, Yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but everyone followed the dictates of his evil heart. Therefore, now notice what God says, Therefore I will bring upon them all the words of this covenant. In other words, the curses of Deuteronomy 28, which I commanded them to do, but which they have not done. Israel played the harlot. Let's read a passage in Ezekiel. By the way, Ezekiel was taken captive to Babylon in the year 597 uh, B.C. Jeremiah lived before Daniel and his friends were taken to Babylon. Let's notice Ezekiel 16, verses 15 and 16, on how Israel became a harlot. She had other lovers besides the Lord. It says there, God is speaking about His people, but you trusted in your own beauty. See, they got proud of themselves. They said, oh, we're so blessed. We have this land flowing with milk and honey. We have all these statutes and judgments which they did not live in harmony with. So God says, but you trusted in your own beauty, played the harlot because of your fame, and poured out your harlotry on everyone passing by who would have it. You took some of your garments and adorned multicolored high places for yourself and played the harlot on them. Such things should not happen nor be. By the way, Daniel, at the very end of uh, the uh, Babylonian captivity, uh, raised this magnificent prayer to the Lord that is found in Daniel chapter 9. 
And uh, I want to read a couple of verses here that refer specifically to Moses. You see, Daniel is confessing. He says, we are sinful. We are evil. We've gone astray from your ways. We did not keep your laws and your statutes and your judgments. We deserve to go captive. We deserved everything that we got. And notice how Daniel says, this is what was predicted by Moses if you were unfaithful to your marriage covenant vows. Let's read verse 11 of Daniel 9. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Now listen carefully. Therefore the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, this is Deuteronomy chapter 28, therefore the, the, the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. Notice also verse 13, as it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us, yet we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. Therefore the Lord has kept the disaster in mind and brought it upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in all the works which he does, although we have not obeyed his voice. So Israel broke their marriage covenant with the Lord. They lost their way. But here's the good news. God always in Scripture has a faithful remnant. We might say a remnant within the remnant church of that day. In the days of Noah, God had a remnant. It was Noah in the midst of a wicked world, many of them professing to serve the true God, but did not live in harmony with His will. Noah was righteous, we're told in Genesis chapter 6 verse 9 and 7 verse 1, and he walked with God. In the days of Lot, God had a faithful remnant. Lot left the city of Sodom. We're told in 2 Peter that he was a righteous man. It's, it's mentioned four times there in 2 Peter. In the days of Elijah, God had 7,000 that had not bent the knee to Baal. In Ezekiel chapter 8, when God is about to destroy Jerusalem at the Babylonian captivity, Nebuchadnezzar was already on his way. God had a remnant in the city that sighed and cried because of the abominations that were being committed about, among those who professed to be servants of God. When Jesus was crucified, multitudes that had previously followed Him cried out, crucify Him, crucify Him. And yet there was a faithful remnant, 120 that gathered on the day of Pentecost together. And the book of Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17 says that there will be a remnant at the end of time who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So God's purpose did not fail. He has always had a faithful remnant within the larger group of those who claim to be servants of God. So now let's talk about the fulfillment of God's plan after the day of Pentecost, spiritual Israel. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verses 9 and 10. 1 Peter 2 verses 9 and 10. Here Peter is going to refer to the verses that we read in the book of Exodus chapter 19 verses 5 and 6, where God says that He chose Israel as a special treasure to become priests to the nations. We find these words in 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. But you, by the way, this is speaking to Gentiles, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, His own special people. So you can see the nuance from Exodus chapter 19. Now why, did, why does God choose spiritual Israel? chosen generation, royal priesthood, holy nation, his own special people. There's a purpose, just like with ancient Israel, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So it's to proclaim how to come from darkness into light. And then it says in verse 10, who once were not a people, 
but are now the people of God, speaking of the Gentiles, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. You see, in the Old Testament, Israel's prosperity would be so great that the surrounding nations would come through Israel and they would say, what's the secret? Why do your animals, why are they healthier, larger? Why do they have more, uh, more calves? And why do they have more sheep? Why does your land produce agricultural project products that are much larger than I, ours? Why is it that there's no sickness or disease among you? We want to know. And so then the Israelites would be able to tell them it's because of the blessings that God has conferred upon us. He has given us righteous statutes and judgments and laws. He's given us all kinds of instruction and we follow that instruction and therefore we are blessed above all peoples to bless all peoples. That was God's plan in the Old Testament. In fact, in Isaiah 61, it says that the nation would come, the nations would come to Israel's light. Now, after the days of Pentecost, Witnessing is still the same, witness to a Messiah that has come, but Jesus doesn't say the nations are going to come through you. He says, go ye therefore and teach all nations. Ellen White has a very interesting, uh, rather lengthy comment about spiritual Israel in the book Prophets and Kings, pages 7, 13 and 714, and I want to read the entire statement because here Ellen White is talking about a spiritual Israel, an Israel that is not localized in one specific place. It is not composed of literal Israelites. It's composed of everyone who has claimed Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Notice what we find in this statement. Ellen White wrote, That which God purposed to do for the world through Israel, the chosen nation, he will finally accomplish through His church on earth today. You catch that? What God wanted to do with the chosen nation, Israel, literal Israel, He will finally accomplish through His church on earth today. He has let out His vineyard unto other husbandmen, even to His covenant-keeping people. Notice, covenant-keeping people, who faithfully render Him the fruits in their seasons. Never has the Lord been without true representatives on this earth who have made His interests their own. These witnesses for God are numbered among spiritual Israel. Now listen carefully. And to them will be fulfilled all the covenant promises made by Jehovah to His ancient people. All of the promises, folks, will be fulfilled with a global spiritual Israel. She continues, Today the church of God is free to carry forward to completion the divine plan for the salvation of the lost race. And then she's going to refer to the 1260 years where God's people were oppressed. She wrote, For many centuries God's people suffered a restriction of their liberties. The preaching of the gospel and its purity was prohibited, and the severest of penalties were visited upon those who dared disobey the mandates of men. As a consequence, the Lord's great moral vineyard was almost wholly unoccupied. The people were deprived of the light of God's word. The darkness of error and superstition threatened to blot out a knowledge of true religion. God's church on earth was Listen carefully now, she's comparing it to the Babylonian captivity. God's church on earth was as verily in captivity during this long period of relentless persecution as were the children of Israel held captive in Babylon during the period of the exile. Let me ask you, were God's people delivered from Babylonian captivity uh, in 1798 with the deadly wound to the papacy? Absolutely. She continues, but thank God. His church is no longer in bondage. To spiritual Israel have been restored the privileges accorded the people of God at the time of their deliverance from Babylon. Did you catch that? Once again, to spiritual Israel, that is God's end time remnant church, 
have been restored the privileges accorded the people of God at the time of their deliverance from Babylon. In every part of the earth, notice this is global now, it's not only in the Middle East, in every part of the earth men and women are responding to the heaven sent message which John the Revelator prophesied would be proclaimed prior to the second coming of Christ. Fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment is come. What church is this passage referring to? Spiritual Israel that God has chosen to complete the divine plan? Folks, it's not all of the Christian churches. It is the remnant church, the Seventh-day Adventist church. You say, how do we know that? Well, let me ask you this. Do you know of any church in the world that claims that their mission is to take the three angels' message to the world? I don't know of any. They say, well, you're supposed to preach the gospel, but the first angel's message not only speaks of preaching the everlasting gospel, it also mentions fearing God, giving glory to Him, and preaching the hour of God's judgment. No church in the world today is preaching the hour of God's judgment except the Seventh-day Adventist church. So when Ellen White says here uh, that God will accomplish His work through the church today, through His covenant-keeping people, uh, with, through true representatives who uh, keep all of the covenant promises, that were in captivity but were released in the year 1798 when their oppressor received the deadly wound. This is referring to the Seventh-day Adventist church. Now let's go to Galatians chapter 3 and verses 26 to 29. Galatians 3, 26 to 29. You know, there we are told that God gave the promises to Abraham and to his seed. Now the question is, who is the seed of Abraham? Let's just go back a little bit before we read verse 26 through verse 29 to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16. It says there, Now to Abraham and his seed, the word seed, the first letter is capitalized. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed who is Christ. How many seeds does Abraham have? Abraham has one seed, and that seed is whom? That seed is Jesus Christ. Now, the question is, how do we understand then what we're going to read in Galatians 3, 26 to 29, where it says that those who come to Christ, believe, and are faithful to the covenant are Abraham's seed. If Abraham's seed is one, how can many be Abraham's seed? Well, let's read the verses, Galatians 3, 26 to 29. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You know, in a recent Sabbath school lesson, I found this paragraph which explains these verses in a beautiful way. I want to read that statement. As a son of Abraham, Christ became, in a special sense, heir to the covenant promises. Why could Jesus become the heir of the covenant promises? Very simple, folks, because He is the only one who was absolutely faithful to the covenant conditions, absolutely obedient. So Jesus inherits all of the covenant promises because He was perfectly obedient to, obedient to the requirements of the covenant. Now what about us? You know, if you go to Galatians 3 verse 16, it says that the seed of Abraham is only one. I read that verse, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed who is Christ. So clearly Paul says uh, Abraham has only one seed, Jesus Christ. So how do we become seed? Well, let's continue reading this statement from the Sabbath School Quarterly. By baptism we acquire kinship to Christ and through Him acquire the right to participate in the promises made to Abraham. So by joining Christ, by a personal relationship with Christ, because Christ inherited the promises, we inherit the promises with Him because we are in Him. 
The statement continues, thus all that God promised Abraham is found in Christ, and the promises become ours, not because of nationality, race, or gender, but through grace, which God bestows upon us through faith. So in other words, Jesus inherits all of the covenant promises, and if we connect with Jesus Christ in a personal relationship, all of those promises become ours as well. We become fellow heirs, and as the text in Galatians 3.29 says, if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Ellen White wrote this beautiful statement in Prophets and Kings 369 and 370. No distinction on account of nationality, race, or caste is recognized by God. He is the maker of all mankind. All men are of one family by creation, and all are one through redemption. Boy, does the world need to hear that today. Christ came to demolish every wall of partition, to throw open every compartment of the temple courts, that every soul may have free access to God. His love is so broad, so deep, so full, that it penetrates everywhere. It lifts out of Satan's influence those who have been deluded by his deceptions, and places them within reach of the throne of God, the throne encircled by the rainbow of promise. In Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free. By the way, do you know that the Old Testament saints, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all knew that the little land of Canaan and local Jerusalem actually pointed forward to inheriting the entire earth at the second coming and the new Jerusalem being here. You say, how do we know that? Notice Romans chapter 4 and verse 13. Here the Apostle Paul wrote the promise that he should be the heir of the world, that is Abraham, the promise was that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. So when we have faith and trust in Christ, we have the same hope that Abraham had, and that is that we will become heirs, not of that little land over there in the Middle East, not of literal earthly Jerusalem, but of the new Jerusalem in an earth made new. This is also what is taught in Hebrews chapter 11, verses uh, 9 and 10. It speaks about uh, Abraham. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he, that is Abraham, waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. That's the New Jerusalem. Notice also verses 13 through 15. These uh, referring to all of those that are mentioned previously in Hebrews 11, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. All these heroes that are mentioned are seeking a homeland. What is the homeland? Ah, verse 15, and truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared a city for them. So spiritual Israel will inherit all of the promises along with all of the heroes of the Old Testament who had faith in Jesus Christ. They will inherit the earth and the capital of the earth will be the New Jerusalem. Now as we bring this to an end, we need to apply it to our own church, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Let me ask you, have we, we received great blessings and great light from the Lord? Do we have a mission that God has called us to fulfill? Absolutely. So what happens if we do not fulfill our end of the bargain. Has God freed us from captivity? Has He freed our church to preach the gospel uh, in full freedom? Absolutely. God chose the Seventh-day Adventist church by His grace. 
not because the original nucleus was the most numerous of people or the greatest people or the people who had most resources, but God chose God's remnant church because He loved them and because He wanted them to fulfill a specific mission that He had for them. And what is that mission? The mission is taking the three angels' message to the entire world. Let me ask you, has God placed the Seventh-day Adventist church in a favored land with principles that allow for the free preaching of the gospel to the entire world? Has He given us a message that makes us stand out above the world? Has He also given blessings and curses to the Seventh-day Adventist church Blessings if we fulfill the mission and curses if we don't. Absolutely. God will have a faithful remnant in the remnant church who will fulfill the conditions of the covenant and the mission that God has called the church to perform. You see, God has given us what He gave ancient Israel. He has given us a patient and godly leader. He has given us an organization that is the envy of many organizations. You know, an organization that begins with the general conference, elders and pastors, deacons, uh, uh, general conference executive committee, like I mentioned before, divisions, unions, conferences, districts, and local churches. Like with ancient Israel, God has given the Seventh-day Adventist church the law. He has given the Seventh-day Adventist church the Sabbath. He has given us principles of health and hygiene. He has given us educational principles that we need to pass on to the next generation. He has given us a system of tithes and offerings to uh, finance the preaching of the gospel. He has given us the sanctuary message. He has given us principles of worship and music. Everything that God gave to ancient Israel to fulfill their mission, which they failed to do, God has given in these last days to the Seventh-day Adventist church. But the Seventh-day Adventist church must meet the conditions. And the question is, are we? Ellen White wrote in Eight Testimonies 247, a long passage with which I want to finish my presentation this morning. This is what she wrote. Our position in the world is not what it should be. We are far, she's writing this back in her days, we are far from where we should have been had our Christian experience been in harmony with the light and the opportunities given us. Had we from the beginning constantly pressed onward and upward. Had we walked in the light that has been given to us had we followed on to know the Lord, our path would have grown brighter and brighter. But many of those who have had special light are so conformed to the world that they can scarcely be distinguished from worldlings. Is it possible we listen to the music of the world and we dress like the world and we eat like the world and we are entertained like the world? I think the answer to that question we, would be generally yes. She continues, speaking about these individuals, I'll go back a little bit, but many of those who have, have had special light are so conformed to the world that they can scarcely be distinguished from worldlings. They do not stand forth as God's peculiar people, chosen and precious. It is difficult to discern between her, him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. And then comes this ominous statement, which perhaps we pass up because we have the idea that God has chosen the church unconditionally and that's it. Notice this statement. In the balances of the sanctuary, the Seventh-day Adventist church is to be weighed. She's not talking about the individuals. She says, in the balances of the sanctuary, the Seventh-day Adventist church is to be weighed. She, that is the Seventh-day Adventist church, will be judged by the privileges and advantages that she has had. Just like ancient Israel, folks. If her spiritual experience does not correspond to the advantages that Christ, at infinite cost, has bestowed on her, if the blessings conferred have not qualified her to do the work entrusted to her. Notice, once again, 
if the blessings conferred have not qualified her to do the work entrusted to her, which is, folks, to preach the three angels' message to the world. She finishes the statement by writing, On her, that is the Seventh-day Adventist church, will be pronounced the sentence found wanting. By the, uh, by the light bestowed, the opportunities given, will she be judged? Folks, God wants the Seventh-day Adventist church to stay on course, to realize what the reason for our election is, why God in His grace chose us to be more prosperous than all peoples of the world, not to arrogantly say, oh, we're so much greater than anyone else, but so that people can see that this church is a church that follows what God says, and as a result is a prosperous, healthy, holy people. God wants the church to come to this condition. And as I end, I ask the question, will we individually and personally, as members of the church, through the grace and power of God, make this happen? May the Lord help us to answer this question with a resounding yes.